Welcome to another episode of Stay Paid. I'm Joshua Stike along with Luke Acri. And today, our interview, we're really going into this topic of niching down, right? We've yep. talked about this a little bit before. The riches are in the niches. You hear that kind of saying. But how do you actually go about that? Yeah. And this person is on track to do 80 million in sales <laughs> and real estate, right? And they did a pivotal thing earlier in their career, which was this idea of niching down. But I'll let you hear the interview for that. Absolutely. We're going to introduce her in just a second. But first, we would love if you take a minute to subscribe to Stay Paid on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. If you're not already subscribed and while there, drop us a review to let us know how we're doing, what you think of the show. Uh, this review comes from Dan Gax08. So Dan G A A A A A X X O A. I don't know how else to say that. J Dan Gax. We'll go with that on Apple Podcast. They say great advice with heart. Five stars. Luke and Josh offer an honest and fresh perspective that is genuinely helpful for anyone trying to break into the world of sales and marketing. You can tell that they really want to see people succeed. And they always choose guests with that same mindset. Great podcast. Awesome. So thanks for leaving that review, Dan. And again, if you leave your review on Apple Podcasts, we'll read here on the show. Now let's get into this week's interview. From Reminder Media, this is Stay Paid, a sales and marketing podcast on a mission to help you close more deals and retain more business. Hosted by the VP of Marketing, Josh Steik, and Reminder Media's president, Luke Akery. So get ready to hear the golden nuggets that will allow you to live a life of freedom tomorrow, but only if you take action today. Today on the podcast, we have Jennifer Egbert, an award-winning luxury realtor specializing in high-end modernist home sales in her native Boulder, Colorado. Working with the area's most sought-after architects, builders, and designers, she combines an unparalleled understanding of the Boulder market with an honest and always straightforward approach that has made her the go-to luxury realtor for clients seeking extra special homes with modern architectural design. Jennifer, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks Jennifer, for being here. Yeah, it's awesome to have you on the show. I'm excited for this uh, interview. This one has started off good. Yeah, because Jennifer said she's going to have the most fly off the handle answers we've ever <laughs> so heard. Like and I was State like, paid. yeah, I was like, oh, this is fantastic. The more late yeah. I was sharing before we came on the podcast, I was sharing, you know, I get interviewed on podcasts a lot now. And yeah. it's really hard on a podcast to not be like to go tense or scripted yeah. or yeah, interview mode. And it's, yeah. it's almost like you get on camera and you freeze and to be relaxed is the hardest thing. So I'm excited for your <laughs> style. It's fantastic. <laughs> so, but to introduce yourself, if you could take a second, share your story of how you got into real estate, how you got into the luxury market and lead us up to today. Cool. Um, so let's see, I'm 108 years old and like 20 years ago, <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to do. Like, I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I was turning 27. I think I had dropped out of college. Like I had gone to college a whole bunch of times, like trying to get through it. And it just was not my thing, like not my thing. And I mean, it was cool, like to be in classes and meet people, but like to sit in a university setting just wasn't for me. And so I had dropped out and I was like trying on different things to do. And it was at that point, I think I was waiting tables and working high-end retail. And um, the thing that I started to notice like with my, both of my jobs is on the days that I worked lunches at this sushi bar, I had exactly the same tables every Tuesday and Thursday. So the same people would come in hmm. every Tuesday and Thursday. And then on the nights, you know, that's different because you have like whoever's coming in the door. And then um, at my retail job, it was like, it's a store called Max here in Boulder. And they're in Aspen and Denver as well. And Max Martinez, who I would say is the person who taught me everything about luxury sales that I really needed to know. Um, he, I had the same thing. I worked Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And on Sundays, we were doing a huge amount of sales out of the store. And it was all my clients. And it was the same clients coming in again every Sunday. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was like, it was cool. I was in my late 20s and I was like, this is great. Like, I'm making good money, but I can't be shop girl forever. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I had a girlfriend who was working. She was like the director of operations for a guy who has a brokerage here in Boulder. And, you know, she had a car, she had bought her first place. She was buying a second place. And I was like, well, that looks interesting. Like she's doing that, but she's also doing sales. And so I remember like I was sitting in a parking lot of this jazz bar and we're, I would, like, we're going in and I was on the phone with her. I was like, I really just need to figure out what I'm going to do. But here's what I think I'm good at. I'm good at people. 
right? I, because I see the same people time and time again. And I said, you know, do you like your judgments? Yeah, you know, it's hard, but I like it. And I was like, uh, you know, and I kind of asked all those questions that I would hope people would ask when they're getting in the real estate, <laughs> but <laughs> when you have to deal with the clientele. But, um, but I, in that conversation, I was just like, you know, I'm going to try it because it sounds like I, I'm a creative type. Um, I'm definitely like a direct person. I hate being told what to do. I'm bad rule follower, like all the things. Right. And so, um, I went and I got my license and I like failed the test twice, passed it on the third time because I'm terrible at standardized testing, all the things. And then just kind of got thrown into the fire, the fire, the frying pan. Um, and it was interesting because I started in 2002. So I don't know if you guys are as old as I'm 48. So it's like, I don't remember if you remember this, but like, remember like people did not want to use email. Like they were yeah. really against using email. Yeah. And so this is what was going on as I was like, okay, well I can build a website. Nobody wanted to build a website. They wanted to do like the book and all these kind of things. And I was like, can I swear on here? I won't swear. So <laughs> I was like, you know, I'm going to, Screw it. I'll just, I'll do the thing. And so I built a website. I had my first client was a listing. They were awful to me. They were getting divorced and they weren't telling me. And so they would call Oof. and yell at me. And so after the fact, they felt bad about it. So they're like, we're branding managers and we do all the branding for like Barnes and Noble and all the stuff. So we're going to oh give you gosh. free branding. We feel so terrible. And so that's really kind of what kicked it off is I had a brand, I had a website and I was comfortable using technology in the early stages of technology as, you know, as it moved over from like, you know, big internet IPOs into just everyday life. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was really like my foray into real estate was like making sure that upfront, it was something that was accessible and easy to look at. And then from there, you know, having to hone your skills because there's so much you have to learn in the industry. Right. Yeah. Now, did you start off in this idea of luxury marketing and this sort of like architectural, you know, like specific style homes, or is that something that came later in your in your career? You know, so here's how it shook out. It's always been my thing, right? Like I've always been in design. Like when I was a little kid, I mean, like, and I think it's in one of my videos, so I feel like I'm a little canned when I'm saying this, but really I do remember my mom being like, okay this is the time you get to decorate your room. You're becoming a teenager. What do you want to do? And I really just wanted it to look like an art gallery. Like my, I'm in my house now. It's all white. Like it just is what it is. Yeah. And so it, so that was where I was at. And I live in this town with like really beautiful historic homes. And then these just really ugly. It's like they had two gross historic and then ranch. Right. Mm. And so I kind of went in always having a, a design mind. And then I, so that, but so at first I did not brand to a niche to answer your question in a very roundabout way. And then what I did was I took, um, when was that? When was Hurricane Sandy? Like 2005 or something? Yeah. Right. yeah. Well, long yeah. time ago. Yeah. No, it was later than that was, that was Katrina, but it, whenever Hurricane Sandy was. It was like 10, or, 10 was, or 11. Yeah. 2010. Yeah. 11, my kid yeah. had just been born. So I took this class that um, Marie Forleo did and it's a B school class and, and it's not in the real estate realm. I've, I've always um, kind of reached outside of our industry in terms of continuing education because I want to see what other people are doing because, you know, real estate marketing and real estate education back in the day was super yellow jackets and canned, you know, what is it? What's, it called? what's this guy's name? <laughs> you know, always be selling and blah, blah, blah. And, and so, so I took this class and it was really cool. And in the class, it was a seminar. I was in New York during Hurricane Sandy. I got caught in it actually. But we took this test called by Sally Hogshead called How to Fascinate. And in the class of How to Fast or in the test results, um, there were 105 of us in the room. Um, nine of us came out with the results that I had and it was sorry my dog is here <laughs> so it was it was good job Astrid um it was uh I was a trendsetter with a high level of prestige a high level of rebellion and a low level of alarm hmm. and what I like about this test and I always encourage people especially when they're getting into rebranding and stuff is like go take this personality test it's actually 
really awesome because it shows you how the world sees you. It doesn't show you how you should be perceived by the world, which is, I think, what we spend a lot of time doing is running around and trying to be somebody who we're not. And so, you know, she said like, so, okay, all you trendsetters, what would you say the common theme is that you think people think of you? And I was like, oh, I'm a weirdo. I'm so weird. I'm so weird. Like I can sit there in a room, I can say a thing and everybody's like, this is the expression that I have seen like all my life is this. And <laughs> You're so used like, to that. I'm very used to that. I get that. <laughs> no, right? So you kidding. might be a trendsetter <laughs> as well. Yeah. And it's a thing. It's a thing when you're like, I think, thinking outside of the box, right? And so she was like, yeah, you literally are sitting there looking ahead. And for the most part, you're like three to five years ahead of where people are comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it's just that you're willing to look outside of what is right in front of you and do that thing. And that was a freaking game changer for me. Like right then and there, it, it like those moments where they call them light switch moments, whatever, that was it for me. Mm -hmm. And I was like, because I was being held back by like, I feel like a weirdo, mm. right? Like nobody wants to be a weirdo. And so I was like, she goes, so you just go with that. Like you go with that thing and do it. And so I was like, all right. So if I'm going to trust my gut in this space, right? Because suddenly I knew that like what I was doing was just thinking ahead. People will have to catch up to me. It's an experience I've had my whole life. I'm just going to go for it. And they'll get there. And that was it. That was like the thing that got me into niche marketing. I was like, I love modern. I have seen maybe four modern homes. We have some really great um, mid-century modern homes in Boulder by Charles Hartling, but they haven't been discovered, rediscovered yet, you know? And I just sat down with a brand. I came back to Boulder. I sat down with a company called Anthem Branding, some buddies of mine from college. And I was like, this is what I want to look like. This is what I want it to be. I want it all clean. I want it to be evergreen. Like I want to look at this in 20 years and still, still love it. Relevant. Yeah. And I do. It's stunning. And it, it really, I think it really caused a paradigm shift in, in our particular market in Boulder because people hadn't seen it yet. They'd seen the flat irons, you know, what you see on everything. You Google Boulder, you're going to see the pictures of the flat irons. They had seen beautiful historic homes, you know, but they didn't want to bank on a couple modern homes. And now we have like a full, hmm. like the most beautiful modern home collection that's been built in the last, you know, decade or so. What a golden nugget there of one is looking at a trend really that's on your own passions, being confident enough to then capitalize that and niche down from a marketing yeah. standpoint. Because Josh and I can even relate from doing this podcast or doing our company. Right. One of the biggest struggles that we have is you really struggle trying to be everything for everybody. Yeah. Like you really, it's so difficult. Like we even think like- You in can't interviews, do it. It's so hard. <laughs> it's like, you're just like, okay, we got to narrow, we got to narrow, we got to narrow. And having the guts to narrow down on a niche that especially at the time you did it, like yeah. now it's probably to everybody like, oh, duh, of course we're going to do modern because who knows how many modern homes are there in your area and it's obviously successful. Great. But back then having that gut to narrow down, like talk to us about the niche marketing that you do. I'm really curious because we haven't had a lot of people talk about luxury marketing. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the marketing that you do? How do you get a property sold? What are some of the unique things you do to generate leads for, you know, high-end market, you know, or listings? Share a little bit about your strategies there. Yeah. So a couple of things that I will say that I hope everybody who's listening and watching today would take within use in their own direction. Right. So um, I, I, we, we were just stepping into, we had had Boulder historically has had an expensive real estate market. We have a growth cap. So it just keeps gaining equity like crazy. Um, and we were just stepping into that space that people might call luxury. Right. So like, I think back then, maybe it was really, really great to get like a $1.25 million listing. And I wanted to be in that space. I, I have done a ton of ninja coaching. And a big part of that philosophy is work less, make more money, which is a great thing to do. And so I, when I 
when I started out with this, like I had, um, I developed what my ideal customer avatar looked like because I think it's really important to know who your audience is. Um, I mean, it's the whole, if you build it, they will come thing exists. And, you know, I'm sure you guys are experiencing that too. Like I just knew, I, I mean, you know, in the world, right? Like you can't go out and be everything to everybody. Mm-hmm. Like it just does not work. And so like, I'm not that chameleon. Like I can't, I'm really bad at fake. Like I'm really bad at faking and I'm a terrible liar. Right. So I knew that like, I just, these were the people that I wanted to be with and I could speak to modern architecture all day long. It got me excited. And so I developed what my ideal customer avatar was and who that person was specifically. And a lot of them didn't exist again in Boulder. And now they're all my clients. And it was so funny. I was sitting there the other day thinking, oh, I need to redefine this. Because I was saying millionaires at the time and multimillionaires, I need to go up to billionaires. Right? (laughs) And so... Because I've had a few. And, and so, you know, and I got to look at that, like, all right, well, I mean, you know, I'm, we have this whole growing, this growing market here. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was, that I got excited about, I should say this, I got excited about it. I got excited about being able to say no to people that I couldn't help. And I got really clear that again, that I would not be everything to everybody and that would be okay. Mm. I can refer it out to the person that it would be great for. And I have a very, very robust referral market as well. So a referral, uh, you know, section of my income. Um, it's in the, it's in the six figures for referrals that I send out. That's incredible. Yeah. Well, I posted a post on my Instagram not too long ago about the power of saying no. And that you read a lot of articles on the the really greats of the world. You're talking like the Warren Buffetts and the Jeff Bezos and these type of people, these business titans. And they write a lot about the ability to say no. And Warren Buffett specifically about being able to say no to clients you don't you can't help, clients you can't work on, ideas that are shiny objects, and your willingness to refer out. I also think it speaks to a mindset of abundance. Because a lot of times when you get, uh, you know, leads coming in, you kind of want to hoard it all and see if you can take it all and, and versus going, hey, I, I'm not the best for My you. My head would explode. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let me give you out. But it creates such a great network amongst other business owners, right? Other real estate agents that you're referring to that now you build relationships with and you can scale your business. So like when you look at your business, like how many transactions or what type of volume uh, did you do last year or will you do this year? It's so interesting. So I just closed out 35 million at the end of May. That's what I closed Ooh. last year. I'm like slated to do 80. Wow. That is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> you got to watch the video. It's Dr. Yeah, Evil. Yeah. yeah her, her expression right there. That's so great. Now, seriously, I'm congrats so on that. Of that. So where do, let's yeah. look at, let's kind of dissect that, right? Let's say you're sure. on track to doing 80 million last year, you did 35. Where are the leads coming from? How do you get the leads? And then maybe talk a little bit about how you're getting the, the buyers for luxury. Sure. Oh, yeah. We, and I need to go back to that for you guys. So how I'm getting leads is I have a very relational referral-based business. Um, the black swan in all of this is that while I've been developing that relational referral business for the last 19 years... Um, with Ninja Coaching and then and then with my niche marketing, because of this niche marketing, and because and I would say too, like my migration from Facebook to Instagram, because Instagram's so visual, and now you know everybody should be looking at TikTok. But from that migration of like, you know, how social media changes into a visual space that people can start looking at. I have people, and the story that I like to tell is. Because of that niche market, I have very prestigious architects come to me and they're who are modern architects who are very comfortable and confident in giving me their clients to take care of. 
So if say they have somebody come to them and they're like, we want to buy in Boulder, we need the land or we need to redo the house. They're like, we know exactly who you need to talk to. And it's because I can A, advocate for them and B, speak the same language that they're speaking and refer them the builders that I think are going to be best for them. And they know that they're going to get the deal done. So that's almost one, like, I was just going to say, that's like a feeder system for you of refer. How, how many architects do you And I had no idea that that was happening, right? Yeah. They came to me. Um, I mean, it's a lot. It's for, you know, yeah. who are doing high volume, like, big boy architecture, beautiful, you know, beautiful, beautiful stuff. So, but that, you know, when you have folks like that, who, and and like, I can think of one in particular who he's designed all these gorgeous homes for them. So when they're ready to sell, I'm their listing agent. That's awesome. You know, it reminds Mm me, um, I was sorry to cut you off there. It reminds me of the idea of like the partnership um, type model within business that so many people miss out on. They don't realize that you have natural people that are synergistic to your industry um, because they work in the similar type of industry. I think of my own real estate agent, Brian, he does a lot for senior um, living, right? So he mm-hmm. does a lot in transition work where he finds seniors and he helps transition them into senior living. Why is he your agent then? You know, he was doing an open house. <laughs> yeah, I'm like... Is well, he your buddy? Guys, I'm, I'm an old soul. I'm an, an, I'm old, an old, soul. old soul, as people say. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm oh an old soul. God. I still love you, Brian, even though you work with seniors. But, but the point being is he gets a ton of his business from elder care attorneys. Elder mm-hmm. care attorneys. And then he also does some other partnerships that he has. And he's done this whole past system and everything like that. But it's kind of touching on the model that's a gold yeah. mine for people that they don't really do. They don't network with whether it's architects or network with elder care attorneys or network with wherever your niche is. Build those partnerships and those networks to be those feeder systems for referrals for you. I think the downfall of most realtors is they will not slow down long enough to honor what they like and how and 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 like we talked about before, they will not slow down enough to say no so that they can have lives that are fun and happy. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and so I feel like, you know how like, well, you guys are in real estate, right? So, but as the realtor, everybody's always looking for this like magic pill, right? Mm -hmm. They want the, they want the secret, the secret. So here's the freaking secret. (laughs) The secret is just niche, like just niche. Just say no to people that you can't serve and understand you can't serve everybody. You will make more money than you can imagine. Like if that's the end goal, right? I mean, like your your agent is helping those fam- like the families also with their parents. And that takes a huge load off. And he knows that. And he's like... All day long, if he's got attorneys like those feeders that are saying, hey, you actually are perfect, even though you're not 65 or 75, like you are the person who we're going to go to every time because every single client feels taken care of Mm -hmm. or heard or you can speak their language or whatever it is. And so, yeah, that's the magic pill. Commitment. That's a secret. Commitment. Uh, I want to jump back to something tactical there because you mentioned customer mm-hmm. avatar, finding your ideal client. And I know we yeah. we hear feedback. Well, how do I do that? What's the process that I go through? What do you include in that customer avatar? And what was your process for doing it? Because you said you want to update it a little bit. So I'm just curious. Yeah. So uh, again, out of that Marie Forleo class, there is a workbook. There's a, a practice tonight send it out to agents all the time now because I'm like, please do this. Like, please understand that you are a great fit for some people. And those some people will turn into abundance, right? And um, so it's a workbook that I do. And I can, like I said, I can look at it and I go, oh, wow. Okay. Things have shifted in the last decade, right? Like I now have, I mean, really like a part of it was like, they were people around my age. They were newer parents. Um, you know, this is the the light part of it. They were either inheriting. They were generational inheritance millionaires, and and they, or they were tech that was moving into the area. Um, they were artists. They were into art, so I could talk to them all day long about art and going to see shows and going to see music and stuff like that. Like 
things that I'm interested in. I grew up in the punk scene, like in the eighties in Minneapolis. And so it was like, that was stuff that I was totally into. And I don't want to like, I'm not going to dress in navy blue and, you know, red lipstick and high heels all the time. I'm going to dress in like, a, you know, a black t-shirt. I'm going <laughs> to come in from outside, forgot to put my makeup on. And so I think that, you know, and that's what I want. I don't want to pretend to be somebody else. So that, um, but, but when I wanted to get into luxury, I had to, I had to, people had to be able to see me, right? Like see find me. And so that migration from Facebook to Instagram was really pinnacle. And the reason why I did it is because Facebook bought Instagram for $4 billion. Mm -hmm. And the statistic is that 60% of the population is visual. So it makes perfectly good sense that Instagram took off like it did, right? And so a girlfriend of mine who has um, a brokerage down in Dallas called Davis and Lane, um, we were sitting there brainstorming one day and she, we started talking about doing this thing where we show people the houses that we're interested in within the guidelines of what the of what NAR says if they're not your listings. And so I developed Boulder Listing of the Day and I started showing the listings that then they're listed by my colleagues and there's a couple of colleagues that still think that's a bad thing, you know, because I still acknowledge who they are and the thing. But I just started showing, like, if you look at my Instagram, we do Boulder listing of the day. A lot of them are my listings now, but back in the day, they weren't any of mine, right? But I knew that I wanted them to be my client. And when you control that narrative, then people are with you the entire time, right? Like they're, they're speaking the same language. So we started Boulder listing of the day. We showed the listings that we're interested in. And over time, they, you know, I'm a long game person and a long game doesn't have to take that long, right? Five, five years until you like corner the market. And so, I don't know, that was like that just moved. It just jumped everything up. That's so funny. The, uh, we just interviewed an agent, um, Shannon Gillette. She's a top 1% realtor in Arizona. And one of her strategies from a content perspective was basically listing of the day. House of the yeah, day. Those are a lot of people so, I've talked to online. Yeah, yeah. I, I tell people, take my ideas. Like, yeah. They're not all mine. Like, it's like that. My friend Elaine. That tactic is so good, though, because it gives you the ability. One is you get to choose the listing. Two, what listing you want to showcase. So you could choose a listing that's in the attractiveness of the buyer you type you want to work with. Um, but it also is good content in the sense of it keeps you active. It's showcasing something of real estate that gives you credibility, that keeps you out in front of people. You mix that in, of course, with all the personal content that you would do or other lifestyle-based content, that's where the real success is going to come. So I want to um, go back to then this idea of you get a luxury listing and how do you get it sold? I mean, all the stuff that everybody does. So here, I think the thing that stands out in terms of selling a luxury listing is you really have to put dollars and time into marketing. Um, video content is at this point, it's such a no-brainer. And I hate saying that because I don't want to insult people who haven't thought to do it or but if you're do not it. doing it, get on the train. Oh my God, like two years ago. <laughs> so just do the thing. So like and, you know, and so what's great is like with our company, so I'm with Mile High Modern and 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 what we've done is we've put aside an entire marketing department. And so the thing that, you know, and then you've got to read, right? Like you got to read like how marketing works because it's changing so quickly these days. Mm -hmm. So outside of just our video content, I'm also like pushing out reels. Um, I'm oh, just, Instagram, Instagram reels, Instagram reels, TikTok. I have to get on there. I, you know, like I'm Gen X. So Gen X on TikTok is kind of hilarious. <laughs> Hey, kind of hey you can find, well, here's the thing, like your niche, right? What, what, um, what's your average sales price? Oh, I think it's two, eight, two, eight. Okay. So two, yeah. so, so, I mean, obviously higher end, I'm not sure how that compares yeah. in the area, but for, you know, for the nation, that's super high end, it's um, super from an average. End. End. Yeah. So you're Still looking for, you're looking for millionaires, um, or people Bill, that or billionaires. Yeah. She <laughs> wants billionaires. So do you have, have you developed, they buy multiple homes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you developed like a list to go after? How do you find them? Are you just putting content out and using your sphere to go network, to get those? Because 
you're doing 80 million this year. Yeah. And what it, from what it sounds like, it sounds like you're getting that mostly from your sphere. Am I wrong there? No, I mean, it's from my sphere and referrals. Okay. From your sphere. So, do you have yeah, any drip and, campaigns or anything like that that you're doing um, for the your database or? No. So how, I mean, we've just mapped out, like what we do is we map out what our marketing looks like at the beginning of the year, right? So okay. we know what our Instagram feed is going to look like. We know that we, you know, who are, who our sphere of influence is. Who our A pluses are, nice. who our A's are, who our B pluses are, who our B's are. Um, and I go through that continuously. Um, I do have a couple of three farms that I'm working in the area as well because they've got homes that I want to represent. Nice. How, how big are the farms? How big are the farms? They're not big. I mean, my database like is maybe, I think the farm is like 362 people. My database nice. is okay. 200. Okay. I keep it small, but that's like, you... small and dynamic. Think about the golden nugget there for everybody listening to this 80 million on track to do 80 million plus from a 200 person database, 200. What, what that shows you right now, obviously you have a farm of 360, but what that shows you is that it's the new. power isn't in necessarily mass marketing to thousands and thousands of people. It's in building actual real relationships with the sphere that you have and the network that you have. And but in in your sphere, obviously you have some feeders, which are really really awesome. Meaning these architects that are sending you referrals and different business. But it just shows you the power of how re- real estate is such a relationship business. It's not oh necessarily God. a mass market. You're not going to run commercials on TV, though. That's not a bad strategy. But that's not where the bread and yeah. butter is. Well, and I'm not transactional, right? Like I can think of like, uh, you know, what is it? Chris Lindahl up in Minneapolis. Like he's got a, t- you know, he created a boutique um, brokerage out of leading, a hu- bring a huge team over from Remax and they're going to be transactional. I think he's got 150 people wow. on that, in that brokerage, right? So he's got to feed people to them. Mine isn't like that. You're you're right. It's it's smaller. It's dynamic. I want to be able to send out 200 invitations to an event the day before the event and have 75 people show up. Wow! Because that's a huge, yeah. huge, you know, sh- like what are you showing? Usually yeah, show it's 10%, rate. Right? Yeah. yeah, whatever it's called. And so so that's what I want. Like I want people to be like, oh, cool, Jen's throwing a party. Awesome. You know, like we're gonna be there. And so even if it's for like cocktails for an hour kind of thing. But th- that's like what I've been able to do. That's super cool. You know, like go like last minute finding out about like a farm, to, you know, farm to table dinner, buying out 32 seats and being able to fill them in 15 minutes. Like that's. So you're doing like those do. type of things for your database. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So yeah. you're doing in-person events. You're doing special things like putting them, you know, buying them a ticket to this farm to table. Totally. Do you s- yeah. do you send them anything like from a mail perspective, gift perspective, email perspective? So we do. So the one thing that I've been super, that I have found to be super successful that my client would, or my client, my coach would kill me if I didn't say is that for people's birthdays, we, every week we go through people's Facebook, you know, go Love through the that. Facebook events yep. and we send birthday flowers every week to people. Birthday so flowers. Have, that's new. I haven't heard that before. That's really good. Yes. Yeah, so like today, and there's some that have been posted, but like I have everybody hang on here. Where is it? You know why also that's good as you're finding that? They're is, like, oh, Yeah, look you. at that. You'll have to watch the YouTube video because she just showed us a picture. But what's so good about that is everybody comments happy birthday on Facebook, but not everybody sends a birthday flower. And who's the person who's going to be memorable? Yeah, it's so simple. That, that's, it's you're going to be deductible. memorable. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. It's and it's tax deductible. It's <laughs> I mean, and that's great. And it's in our marketing budget, you know, and our P&Ls, we've managed to keep really low. Um, so yeah, so I think I would say, you know, there's uh, those personal touches I think are really important. I think it's, you know, I like, I like writing handwritten notes. I like sending birthday flowers. I love doing events. They don't have to be these big, huge events. I actually want to be able to talk to people at the event and I don't want it to be a Jen Egbert event. I Mm. want it to be, it's my clients. Like we love you. Like without you, Mm. you know, I would have to look for another job. So no, that's fantastic, Jen. Before we, uh, I want to ask you one final question before we close out here. We like to ask everyone who comes on the podcast that's super successful. Obviously, you are. What are some of the routines or habits that you uh, do every day? Maybe two to three different habits that you're doing every day that have really driven uh, your success. 
I, you know, so doing like, so once a week, I mean, I, I speak with my coach once a week. So I think that's super important is to have somebody who's whipping you into shape um, systems wise, making calls every day and you don't have to make a ton. You don't have to stay on the phone for a long time, but make at least 10 calls a day to Love your it. sphere and say hi and don't talk about real estate. Just check in on people. Huge tip. Yeah. Um, that is so very important. Uh, the birthday flowers, we send them out every week. Um, handwritten notes, thank you notes, like just get an Emily post book and like realize like we get so much email, right? We get so much, you know, visual trash that it's really nice just to open up a handwritten note that says, thank you. Yep. Um, I love that. Um, you know, and then it's things like I got to go work out. So I've got to go for a hike or I've got to go. I box with a, with a, uh, trainer and it's, it's, I'm a, I'm an aged athlete who can't do my sport anymore. So you're, a, you're an old play. soul. You're an old soul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an old soul who has really bad shoulders, so I can't swim butterfly anymore. So boxing, though, it's letting me exert that same energy that the pool did for 15 years, where you're just like sweating and you're tired and you're breathing. And I need that. Like, I just need to do that thing. Um, and then, you know, I, those are the big things that stand out. There's, I would say like COVID has taught me... Um, that I'm probably more of an extroverted introvert. I thought I was an extrovert for a long time. And so I really enjoy just like chilling out with my family. And it's nothing like we're not like the Pinterest family. We're a hot mess over here. Like we are like ADHD and flying around and all those kind of things. However, like we will go to the tea shop every morning together as a family before things happen because we can't always meet for dinner. We have a 10 and a half year old and my husband's got his own thing going on. And that is just like our own little time to connect. Um, and it's really important. And like every morning, my daughter, awesome. before she goes down to like play video games, comes in, we snuggle up for about five minutes, talk, and then she goes. And That's so awesome. I think it's just those little things, right. That like add up to just some good quality time. Yeah. Sounds I love how you start. I mean, relationships highly, highly focused there in your daily routines, relationship with your clients, relationship with your family, and then yeah. obviously taking care of yourself. So thank mm -hmm. you so much for being here, Jen, before we close out, let yeah. people know how they can connect with you. Oh, so you guys can find me. You can find me on Instagram. It's at Jennifer Preddy Egbert, P-R-E-D-D-Y-E-G-B-E-R-T. Um, my website's jenniferegbert.com. Um, always reach out if you guys have questions ever. It's DM me on Instagram. Um, but that's the easiest way. I am on Clubhouse too. And that's another thing too that we didn't get to talk about. But if you guys are on Clubhouse, find me on Clubhouse and nice. um, let's connect there at Social Estates because that has been a remarkable um, place for agents behind, to connect. Behind the scenes. That's where, we're, that's where I first found out about you. So then I started following oh, really? Instagram. Yeah, from here and just speaking a clubhouse room. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no, thank you for being awesome. here thank you all so much for listening dive deeper to this episode we're going to include all of those links um to uh to jen that she mentioned there you can go to staypaidpodcast.com and while there you can also find the video for this episode if you're looking for ways to support the show there's only two ways we ask you to do that first is to head on over to apple podcast rate us five stars leave us a comment let us know what you thought about this episode and the second way is to share this with a friend if you want to get hold of me or luke you can email us the old-fashioned way at podcast at ReminderMe.com. People are comfortable with email nowadays. Or you can find us on Instagram. We're at Stay Paid Podcast. For this episode of Stay Paid, I'm Joshua Stike. Guys, and I'm Luke Acree. And here's your action item. This is awesome. Do something for the people's birthdays on Facebook this week. Literally, whether it's the birthday flower idea, maybe it's a brownie you send them. There's a lot of great sites out there that will allow you to send some brownies. Could be a handwritten card. What a simple hack that you can add to your weekly activity where you just find all the birthdays that are happening on social media and you write them a personal letter. Remember this, the difference between a top producer and a mediocre producer in every single business is top producers take action. Take action on that today. 